Good morning. And this morning we're going to sing a, a song that we learned last week, and it's called I Believe, and it, it basically walks us through the beliefs of a true Christian, what the gospel truly is. So uh, if you don't know this song, uh, let's learn it together, and if you do, sing along. Um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be doing the song here for a few weeks. So uh, join us as we sing this morning. salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is destined. And all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is. Imagine, ears have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rose a roaring light. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I can never walk away from the one who saved my life. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I can never walk away from the one who saved my life. Walk away from the one who saved my life. And all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is evermore.
Please take the next few moments and greet those around you.
may be seated. Take out your program if you would and uh, take it and tear off that right hand section and take a moment and put your name on there on the flip side if you have some prayer requests. Put those in there as well. Drop them in the two little black boxes out there in the lobby afterward. That would be great. If you're a guest here for the very first time, make sure you see Anita out there, but you can give us your name, your address, your telephone number, your email information if you're a guest today. And then stop by the information desk, and we have a bag for you with the gift of things in there about our church. And we encourage you to do that. And if everybody put those in at the end, that's very, very helpful. Well, I want to thank everyone who gave birthday cards and birthday wishes for me this past week. It is greatly appreciated. I thank you for that. We have a great opportunity on Tuesday, August 8th, to gather together in community. One of the things we do is like to get together and do some fun things through the year, and one of the things we do is go to the River Bandits game. So join us down by the river on August 8th, Tuesday, Modern Women Park. Cost is $12. I'll be out there. Uh, it's on that table out there to sign up and uh, give us your money if you would, and that includes a, a night where we're going to have $2 hot dogs, T-shirt giveaway, $2 sodas, and so great night of fun for the family. And Invite anybody you want, even outside the church, your family as well. We encourage that. So see me afterward if you're interested in that. Adult Connect Groups and Sunday School for Children and Teens at 1045 today. Uh, and the adults, we're working through the Book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 4, which is a challenging passage that we'll be looking at today with J.D. Greer. And then break up for some discussions, so we encourage you to do that. Tonight at 6 o'clock at Calvary Church in Moline um, is the Quad City Quarterly Prayer Meeting with area churches. And so I'll be one of the folks there, one of the pastors praying. We encourage you to come out. It's one hour long. We start at 6, we finish at 7, and we just encourage you to be a part of that. And the information is there about it. And also Rick McGue, who's in charge of the Quad City Prayer Meeting, is also putting together an unshakable conference. That's Saturday, August the 5th at 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. at New Life Church in Moline. It's free, and there's information in your program for, with, about that as well, and there's a website. There's no need to register. You just show up, and we encourage you to think about that. They're going to talk about climate change. They're going to talk about evolution versus creation, all kinds of uh, interesting topics dealing with biblical perspective, apologetics. So it's good for young people as well as adults. Just want to remind you that um, encourage you to, to give faithfully. Uh, it's been pretty slim this summer, and we just encourage you to give generously. Or maybe you've been a little behind. We encourage you to catch up. But just to remind you the ways to give, you can do it through our app or our website, through Tithely, our online giving service. You can drop them in the box here. You can mail them in, and you can just drop them in through the week. Just stop by the church, and um, we can put it in the box. So we just encourage you to give. and. Be faithful in your giving. Let's bow for prayer as we think of the needs of our people and also for uh, the blessing for the offering. Father, we come before you today. and We know that there's people in our church that are looking for jobs, that are healing from illness. Some are uh, in skilled care places right now. Some are dealing with pain, waiting surgery. Lord, you know each and every person that I'm talking about and their needs. And we pray you'll reach down and meet each need in your way, in your time, for healing, for finding a job, for whatever it may be, Lord. We know that you're on the throne, you're in control, and we claim by faith that you will uh, minister and meet these needs. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege to give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with. We thank you for the faithful giving of our people. And Lord, help us as we are dealing with the shortfall to catch up and uh, to watch our expenses, but also catch up in our giving. And we pray that uh, we will all uh, consider how we can uh, be faithful in this opportunity to give back to you. Because ultimately we're giving to you. It's a praise offering showing our commitment and love to you by giving of our tithes and offerings. So we pray you'll bless this offering this week. Use it to further your kingdom. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you to... 
turn your attention to the screens or to the back of your program as we go into our time of responsive reading. And just a refresher on the purpose for our responsive reading. Um, the reason that we do this, first of all, is to incorporate a little bit more um, theology into our, our services, a little bit more understanding of, of Scripture, a little bit more understanding of who God is. But it also gives us an opportunity to read God's Word aloud together and to declare the truth together that's found in Scripture. So let's answer today's question, question 14. Did God create us unable to keep his law? Now, if you would, read that answer with me. No, but because of the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all of creation is fallen. We are all born in sin and guilt, corrupt in our nature, and unable to keep God's law. And if you would, read with me from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 as well. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. But praise God, praise God, that through Christ we can be forgiven of our sins. Let's stand together as we sing of the great sacrifice of Christ on the cross. His 
assured and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure Christ the shore of our salvation ever faithful ever true we will hold fast to the anchor it shall never
seated. I encourage you to take out your Bible, turn over to Luke chapter 10. We'll get there shortly. Luke chapter 10. We're going to set aside 1 John today. I've had a lot of people ask to uh, speak longer about Kenya, so we'll do that. I, I want to give a caveat about our pictures. We didn't have Dennis Bland or Kerry Zanke on the trip to take pictures. Um, and then we were told we weren't allowed to, you know, showcase people. We had to kind of do it incognito. And so I spent more time on my pictures in Adobe Photoshop than my sermon. So some of them are so-so and some are good. So just want to give that caveat out there. We were not allowed to just walk up and have people pose because it make them feel uncomfortable. So we tried to get them in the events that we were in. So, so as you know, I just returned from this trip July 6th through the 13th. And while these thoughts and stories are fresh on my mind and what has impacted me so much, I thought I would share briefly about this experience and how it translates for our church family. First of all, I never traveled 26 hours on a plane, okay? That's not including layovers, okay? That's 26 hours. Furthest I flew was from New York to Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, which was about nine, ten hours. And so uh, the mind can absorb what the seat can endure, is the truth, as you sit on those planes, okay? And we were 8,600 miles from home. You see a picture map there on my right. You see Kenya on the east coast, the Indian Ocean. That's where we were. Uh, we landed in Nairobi, and then we went on to... Mendili on Saturday morning where we would spend our four and a half days or so time on our visions trip. And so the purpose of this trip, you know, missions trips all have different uh, purposes. This one was to bring pastors in to see where our money and our prayers are going and see what's going on in the field so we could come back and report, but also to encourage other pastors who may not even know about the Timothy Initiative here in the Quad Cities, uh, more about that ministry, and Dennis Bland's an ambassador, so we're going to be going out and talking to more pastors. So that was our purpose. Now, the first impressions of Melindy, first next picture you'll see there is a picture of us meeting on Saturday morning. It was on the fourth floor of a building, uh, all open windows, a few fans. It was very warm there. It was the rainy season, so it was really their cooler season. And so we were on the fourth floor with about 50 people. This is the training of the trainers, T.O.T. And they were working on books three and four with the Disciples Making Disciples curriculum from the Timothy Initiative in Swahili. They could speak English, so we had some good communication even without a translator at times. But these people were working on uh, the book of, or the Minor Prophets and so they broke us up in groups. They put all of us pastors in different groups. And my group was working on the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. And so each group had to study it, give a report back. And I was impressed with the depth of knowledge. 
and the depth of insight that these students had. There was one gentleman I talked to who had traveled overnight. It took him all night to get there, and then after this eight-hour session, he was going to have to spend the night and get transportation back. And so they were very committed. Nobody's expenses were paid. They came because they wanted to learn more about God's word so they could go back and tell their people. The next picture uh, I think is, yeah, so there's Barnabas on, my, on, on the left side, and that is the trainer of trainers, and Barnabas was our translator from the office there in uh, Nairobi. Um, and I think there's a, the next picture shows some of the office staff, if you would, yes. So you see Dale there, and then you see Wangui, and then you see Brenda, and then you see Eva. They're, one, they're just a small portion of the 30 people who staffed the Nairobi office that covers all of Africa. And they were our hosts and they were our translators throughout the week. So we saw, we see these people and, and, and the Sunday morning um, after that, we, we went back to our place and then Sunday morning we got up and we went to the Timboni village in Mendili. Now let me just share a little about it. You can see the picture of the kids there. First of all, if you notice, Behind them is all tree limbs that they've put together, and then he took corrugated metal. So this picture was very dark when I showed it because there's hardly any light in the room. But this girl in the forefront, she was the worship leader. As we arrived, she was dancing and singing and leading everybody in worship. And uh, this, this room that we're talking about is no bigger than this wing right here where all the people would gather. Dirt floor, plastic chairs. And so as we come in, we're singing. And the background to this is that this, was, this is the landfill for Mendili. That this was a place where it was a forest and many people came and did all kinds of crime and killed people and nobody knew who killed who. And so the government came and tore down all the forest and made it just uh, a flat land where vegetation grew up. This is where the garbage trucks come from uh, Melindi to, to drop off the garbage. And these people that were part of this church, they find their food in the garbage dumps that's, that are brought out there to the landfill. So Pastor Jefferson, when he first came here to plant the church, his first service, they were praising God and he was preaching and all of a sudden, the sound of a garbage truck came and all the people jumped up out of that little church and ran out and got their food and then they came back and finished their service. That's how desperate these people are. But they love Jesus and it's, it's just amazing, their commitment. So the next slide, this one's not a very good picture either but because it's very dark. But over on the right there is Pastor Jefferson. And so Pastor Jefferson's a single man. He lived in uh, in, in, inside the city there, Melindy, and so he decided to move out there and plant this church. So he added a small room onto this building next to him and built a little corral for his goats and for chickens were running around all over the place right outside the church and he wanted to live with these people to minister to them. Gave up his job, gave up everything and moved in to the landfill with these folks. Well, in the course of that, we see Esther, go ahead, next slide picture, Esther over here. So Pastor Jefferson led Esther to Christ, and I'll share more about Esther's story in a little bit. And so um, Esther was sharing a testimony about how she came to Christ. And then after that, after we left Jefferson's church, we went to Esther's church. And Esther meets with 12 ladies on Wednesday as her husbands are at work, out in the open, under a tree, they lay a mat out on the ground, and that's where the kids sit. And I was amazed. Every time we had church, kids sat there for an hour and a half, well-behaved, taking everything in. Of course, they led the music when we had the music time. But you could tell that Pastor Jefferson had led Esther to the Lord, and now she is planting her church. And then that afternoon, we had the privilege to uh, oh, here's a picture of some of the people in Esther's church, by the way. See the colorful outfits that they have? And the ladies shared the gospel, or shared how the gospel had transformed their lives. There's a picture of a little guy here. He's just sitting there, and that's their seating. 
a stump of wood or whatever they can find, that's what they sit on, and that's what we sat on most of the time we were there. Then that afternoon, we went out to the Indian Ocean, and I had the privilege of baptizing four new believers. There were four pastors. We all got to baptize four. Thank you, Dennis, for this picture. He did the work on this picture. And uh, it was just awesome to be able to be in the warm waters of the Indian Ocean and baptize these new believers. Some of them were from Esther's church as well. So then the next day, um, uh, on Monday, oh, let me show this one. This is for Chuck, you know. <laughs> so we have this drum up here. We have a shield. We have seven microphones, and they have a bucket and a stick. So there you go. That's what they do. So on Monday morning, we went to another training center, and you see Barnabas and myself there. And at the training center, uh, they were working on the book of Luke, the book of Luke. And it was great to hear again, breaking us up in groups and studying with them. And then each group gave a report on the section of scripture. And it's just incredible to realize the depth of knowledge that these people have and the ability to interpret and communicate the word of God. And this material is pretty in-depth stuff, so it's not just basic stuff. So we were at um, this, this training center, and Pastor Edward is with Pastor Edward. Pastor Edward is in charge of this training center, and I had the opportunity to share scripture there, and then we got this picture together. And then we went on to a church, another church, and I just want to show this slide. So on my right, in the dark shirt, this is Pastor Emmanuel. He's the regional coordinator over all the uh, area of Kenya and the, and the coastline. His goal is to plant 4,200 churches. And they already got several hundred already, and they're growing quickly. Next to him is Pastor Edward. Now, he is the Timothy to Emmanuel. In other words, Emmanuel led Edward to the Lord, and then Edward grew, and then he led Albert to the Lord in the, you know, in the red and gold shirt there, and then white is Francis. So you see the whole line of people, how it works. Pastor Emmanuel led Pastor Edward. Pastor Edward led these two men to the Lord, and we went to both of their churches out in the bush uh, to see them. And so it was amazing, amazing opportunity. And so that's what the Timothy Initiative is all about. It's the model of Paul, an indigenous leader who's identified and trained to be a church planting mentor. The Timothy, a local believer who's trained like by Paul to make disciples and plant churches. And a new believer is the Titus who enters into an intentional discipleship with Timothy together. And Timothy and Titus plant churches. And they just multiply. And what was so cool is everywhere we went, you saw this progression of three people, a Paul, a Timothy, a Titus. They shared their testimonies. And then we'd go to their churches after we'd hear their testimonies. And so it brought great comfort to me that when we have Dale here and we hear about these things, it's absolutely true on the field that they have great, great accountability for what they do. And then um, you see this next picture. And the lady in the middle... I wanted to highlight her because she shared about how she came to faith in Christ with Esther. And uh, one of the things we'll, we'll see in just a moment is more detail about her story. I want to talk about that. Is the next picture? Yeah, go, okay. So this next picture is the stones. So this woman, I can't remember her name, but she was sitting in front of her house. She had two kids. She had a husband. Husband was at work. And they take these big rocks, and they have a hammer, and they break them into those small, smaller size pieces of pebble and rock. Then they sell that to construction people, and that's how they make their money. Now think about that. They sit there all day breaking these things up. And so Esther came along. She was walking through, and she met this woman. And it was, it was that day that she was determined, this young woman, to commit suicide. She was going to leave her kids behind, her husband, she thought they'd be better off without her. And Esther comes and engages her in a conversation and leads her to the Lord. And we got to hear her testimony. So that's why I have a picture of those stones, because it was part of the spiritual conversation that began 
what are you doing with these stones that led her to share Christ uh, with her as well? So you never know how God's going to use you. Uh, just a few fun pictures of safari. You see the giraffes there out in the wild? That was good. You know, we have deer crossings here. Here we have giraffe crossing right in front of us as we're going through. You know, there are some impalas, not the car, but the impalas. Those are real impalas there. And um, also you see uh, zebra. We see, oh, you're, you're on the, there you go, zebra. Zebra, and then we saw an elephant just a few hundred yards from our uh, vehicle as we went through. On that safari, we spent five hours. This park is the size of New Jersey, and it's open for you to drive through and take pictures and see the animals in the wild. And this last picture is us as a group uh, stopping in the middle of the safari for lunch. And this is the group of people uh, from the Timothy Initiative on the ground and also the pastors and one elder from other churches as well. I had the privilege of being with uh, Derek Armstrong and Barry Steiner, who are pastor, and, and he's the, one of them's mission coordinator at Bettendorf Christian Church. So it was good to get to know those guys on the trip. So here's some takeaways from the trip, and I encourage you to take out your notes because we'll switch now to God's word here in a minute. But one thing that I was just amazed at is every heart has needs. Every human heart has a story to share. And it's interesting as they shared their testimonies about what they were going through, depression, relationship issues with their husbands and wives and other things. I thought it's no different in that culture than here. It's just a different context altogether. Another thing I took away from this trip is we're all part of the human race. And it was so cool to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ and to think about in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 that one day those folks, as well as many others from around the world, are going to stand around God's throne and we're going to sing praises to him together. It really brings it home what the universal church of the body of Christ is all about. It was refreshing to see the power of God's word and the power of preaching at work in Kenya like it does here in the U.S. The word of God, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit are universally powerful as evidence in the testimonies given of those who shared how they came to faith in Christ. Teaching that once a believer is born again, one of their responsibilities that they're taught at the very beginning is that they're to go out and lead others to Christ, and then as they're discipled, to use that same information to disciple others as well. So the Timothy Initiative is the model of ministry and definitions. Now I want us to turn now to our scripture reading as we spend a few minutes in God's word this morning, talking about how to develop and maintain a burden for the lost. That's been the thing I've thought about the most coming back on the plane. It's one thing to have a burden, but how to maintain and develop that. And we're going to talk about that. Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 5. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the music we sang today, and we think about all the knowledge that you've built into us since we've become believers in Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us these uh, experiences and knowledge to be able to share it with others. And Lord, I pray that we will have a sense of urgency and a sense of focus to make sure that weekly we are seeking out spiritual conversations with people. Lord, the gospel is so powerful. Your word is so powerful. 
And we pray that we could reflect that in our stories that we share of how you've changed us. And also to share the word of God and how it could change others' lives. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So how can you and I develop a burden for lost people? I have that, but how do you maintain it? How do we keep it going? Before this trip, I was so captivated with the details of the trip. We're in the middle of remodel. There's all these things going on. And uh, when I finally got on the plane, it brought front and center. What is the most important things to keep in mind? And, and of course, one is to share, to share the gospel. So begin, number one, by praying for a burden for the lost. Because what's really going to matter in the end? You know, God's word and souls will be what is eternal in people's lives. Whether they go to heaven or hell is so important. So begin by praying for a burden for the lost. To add this to your prayer list, if you don't have it there already on your daily basis. It says in Luke 13, 34, Jesus praying over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. He could see and sense the lostness of these people, the hopelessness the despondency, how far away they were from God. And so he saw the crowd as a group of sheep who were lost and without a shepherd. And he desires that all be saved and remain under his care. In this case, he was especially burdened about those who were Jewish, just like he was and still is. And we may currently be apathetic or complacent about sharing Christ with those who are lost, but start from where you are today and pray. And as you read the news and see the terrible things that are happening to people, pray as Jesus prayed for them to hear the truth and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We may not know how to pray for the lost. Ask God to give you a burden to see people as God sees them. How does God see people? He sees people who know Christ as Savior, and he sees others who potentially have the, well, hopefully will have the opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior but they're lost, they're separated from him. Pray against the attitude that Jonah had toward the Ninevites. Jonah did not want to go to the Ninevites, the Gentiles, and share with them the message of the kingdom of God has come near, and if you reject it, destruction and judgment is going to come upon you. And so he went as far away as he could from what he was supposed to do. But of course, you know the story. God had a big fish swallow him up, and there was a, a... a sense of repentance in Jonah as he went. But even in the end, after Nineveh repented, after he shared the message in Jonah 4, he still, he still looked at it as it was something he had to do begrudgingly. God wants us to have a positive attitude to reach out to those around us. So when we pray for a burden for the lost, look out because soon God will be bringing people your way who need Jesus. I think of opportunities on the plane rides to be able to talk to people. When you have opportunity to talk to somebody that may not be a believer and they're going through a difficult time, to pray with them, that begins to open up spiritual conversations. I've only had one person in my life uh, that didn't want me to pray with them. Most people want prayer, even if they're not a true believer in Christ. And so opportunities to share Christ by sharing your personal story. Your story of how you came to faith in Christ is so powerful because you've experienced it. And it's something you can share firsthand. And you can let them know how Christ has changed your life. Second of all, be a student of people. Be a student of people. Now, I'm not talking about staring or stalking people, but listen to people that are around you having conversations. You know, like in the locker room at the Y or... Uh, different places that you go, you're sitting around, you're hearing conversations or smaller kids playing and conversing. There's times I like to sit back and watch people and hear their conversations. When I was in Atlanta, I had an 11-hour layover. We arrived at 9 o'clock in the morning. We weren't flying out till 8 that night. So I found a spot and just, I even conversed with some people, but just to hear people and what they're going through as they share in their conversation. I sat next to a man who was from um, Kenya, or I'm sorry, he's from Paris, France, and he was flying from Atlanta to Paris, and I sat next to him, and 
He told me he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't go to church. He has a very complicated relationship with his girlfriend and two kids, and he travels all over the world building machines for unique applications. And he makes a lot of money, but his, his girlfriend is not happy. I talked to a lady flying from uh, uh, Paris to Nairobi. She sat next to me, and she was from Kenya, but now lives in the United States in Dallas, goes to a non-denominational church, and is a believer in Christ and was headed to visit family. These are opportunities that you have. When we were on vacation, my wife was, uh, we were in the Bahamas for one day, and my wife pulls out this book, Sent, talking about evangelism. And she sat down to read it, and a woman said, oh, and what are you reading? What's this book about? And my wife says, well, it's about telling your story about how Jesus has changed your life. And she said, wow, I got a lot of questions about Jesus. And so my wife didn't get in the water much that day. She was talking to people. But there's opportunities all around us, wherever you go. So it was refreshing to see the power of God's word and the power of preaching working in Kenya, just like it does here in the U.S. The word of God, the gospel of Christ, and the Holy Spirit are universally powerful. I think that's encouraging for us who are here and maybe haven't traveled abroad, but to see the very things we do in a different context are going on around the world day after day after day. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Remember, it takes a clear presentation of the gospel bathed in prayer versus the scripture, which is part of the transforming process and the work of the Holy Spirit to bring someone to Christ. So that's the question I asked myself when I come back from Kenya. How does this translate here at home? And it's caused me to look at people here in our surrounding communities in a new light, to look more and more for opportunities to share the gospel. Jesus was a student of people. He said in Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So I encourage you to see the needs of people as Jesus does and have a heart of compassion while you're standing in line at High V or at the bank and waiting to get up or whatever, look for those opportunities to kind of sense the needs of people around you. Thirdly, pray daily the prayer of peace. Pray daily the prayer of peace. David Nelms, one of the founders of the Timothy Initiative, shared this scripture with me one of the first times I met with him here in the Quad Cities. He might have even preached it here when he was here. But in Luke 10, the scripture reading we read, it talks about how Jesus was preparing 72 people to go out as kind of his upfront team to prepare for him to come to these cities and to preach the gospel and to heal people and to teach about the kingdom of God. And he sent them out. He says, don't take anything with you. Don't take a knapsack. Don't take food. Trust God along the way. But then he said in verse 8 of Luke 10, he says, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. In the preceding verse, he says, you've prayed the prayer of peace. They've accepted your peace. What is the peace? The gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of God. And he says, but he goes on to say in verse 10, but whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to, your, to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. You go where people are receptive and open. And if they aren't, then you move on to see where God would have you go to someone else. Remember, it's our responsibility, compelled by the love of God, to share the good news of Christ with people. Some will be open, some will uh, listen and ponder it and accept it respectfully. Some may reject it, but we are to be faithful to share because we never know who we're gonna, God's going to bring into our life to intersect with us today to bring words of encouragement, prayer, or to start a spiritual conversation with the hope of sharing the gospel. Our responsibility, if you ever listen to WDLM at 5.55 in the morning to 6, they always have Ron Hutchcraft on, former guy from Youth for Christ. And several times he talked about this. This should be our prayer. Pray for an open door. You see it on the screen. An open heart and for us to open our mouths. And if you start your day like that, I'm amazed 
how God brings somebody into your life, even in that day. If we pray for open door, open heart, and an open mouth for us to be willing to speak, maybe it's just a little bit. Maybe it's just finding out if they believe in God. Or maybe it's the great opportunity to share the whole gospel. But I believe people are open-minded and respectful. They're willing to listen to a clear presentation of the gospel if we take time to be available to share. Dale McCauley on this trip shared this quote with us. It talks about our human responsibility. It says, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Now I know God's elected, God's predestined, God's foreordained. That's God's side of the equation. But we have a responsibility as human beings to be the conduit, to be the instrument to take the gospel. And that's why the Timothy Initiative and so many other organizations that are partnering together, Wycliffe, to get the word of God in the language of people and to get the gospel to as many people as quickly as possible around the world. It's amazing with technology how this is speeding up faster and faster to be able to give the gospel, at least get it in the language of the people groups that still need it as well. Fourthly, pray for the seeds of the gospel that are sown. It's one thing to pray for burden for the lost and to have the opportunities to share, but then as you share and the seeds of the gospel are given, pray for their uh, moving closer to the line of faith to accept Christ as Savior. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. He said, I planted, Paul did, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So we talked a number of times about CPR, cultivate, plant, reap. Sometimes when we're in a conversation, we're just stirring up the soil to begin the opportunity for people to be receptive to the gospel. Other conversations, maybe they've heard the gospel and you're planting more seed. And then, obviously, the fun part of it all is that when we have the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. But we're to be used to cultivate sometimes, to plant, and then to reap. We have to be available to do that. God prepares the soil on which the seed of the gospel will fall. In Matthew 13, the parable of the four soils. You remember they cast the seed broadly and it was on the path and the birds came and devoured it for some. The seed hit rocky ground and it was washed away in the rain. The thorns and the weeds, as the seeds began to grow, the thorns and weeds came and choked it out. But then the fertile soil for growth, those who truly received the Savior. The average person needs to hear the gospel seven different times to come to faith in Christ. You realize 95% of the people that come to Christ do so because someone, a friend of theirs, invited them and shared the gospel with them. So you are important. We must learn to effectively share the gospel. And it's okay to bring people to church where they will also hear the gospel or an event where the gospel is shared and an invitation is given. That's why at every wedding, every funeral, Easter, Christmas, and numerous times throughout the year, I always share the gospel because it's what transforms lives. So ultimately what the Timothy Initiative teaches and I believe is the biblical approach is for each of us to share Christ with our friends, our family, our coworkers, our classmates, young people, people on our sports teams. And then after we lead them to Christ, then we are the ones to disciple them and give them a good foundation to build their Christian life upon. That's exactly how Christianity has grown to be the largest, and I don't like the word religion, but if you're going to categorize it with the other religions, Christianity is over 2 billion people, of course some of those are nominal Christians, but because of multiplication, this process that we've talked about, that is what's caused Christianity to grow so rapidly and so far worldwide. The challenge before us here at Pleasant View is to move away from the models we grew up with in the American church and American Christianity and return to how the Bible wants to see people come to Christ and then we in turn share the gospel. We become the disciplers to teach them to disciple others as well. 
But the foundation of all this is prayer. Prayer is the key. And my former pastor said this often, nothing of eternal value is ever accomplished apart from prayer. And I believe that. If you want something to see people's lives change, it begins with prayer. Number five, pray for more faithful workers for the harvest. For the harvest. Luke 10, 2, same chapter, Luke 10. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. On September 16th, Saturday, Don and Jody Green, who are our missionaries with Crew, Campus Crusade for Christ, is going to bring a evangelism seminar here to our church. And uh, we'll be telling you more about it. It'll be a couple hours on Saturday morning to help you get tips and get focused and kind of reignite us as a church in this area of evangelism. And Psalm 126, 6 says, He who goes out weeping, burdened for the lost, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Proverbs 11:30 gives us a promise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Lastly, I want us to be enthusiastic about our church and our church family. The goal for the spiritual leaders in the church family is to have a healthy church. That is what I strive for as pastor. That's what the elders and deacons and ministry team leaders are all about, to do things that are scripturally sound, developing healthy relationships among the body of believers here. And we do our best to resolve conflict, and we passionately use our spiritual gifts to minister, grow, and disciple people on our watch. And the byproduct of a healthy church is that of spiritual and numerical growth. In Acts chapter 2, take your Bible and we'll finish there. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Typo up there, 42 through 47. Acts 2. This is the early church, shortly after the Holy Spirit has come. And they're now called the way. They're not called Christians, they're called the way, the followers of the way. The way of the Nazarene, Jesus Christ. And this is their report at the beginning of a healthy church. And they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and dis- distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. We don't have time to go in detail, but that's a picture of a healthy church. They studied the word of God, apostles' teaching. They fellowshiped together in deep community. They broke bread. They, they shared communion together and they prayed together. And then they eat together in their homes. So here's some applications very quickly as we close. First of all, urgently act on your burden for the lost. Why? Urgently act on your burden for the lost. Do you realize 332,000 people die every day? That's 3.85 people per second. Four people die per second. Many of them into a Christless eternity. Think about that. Second of all, one life changed with the gospel can and should lead to others. I can tell you story after story in previous churches I've been in. I remember a second grade girl that we picked up on our bus to take to Iwana. She was the first one picked up and the last one to go home. And we'd drop off about, pick up and drop off about 60 kids. So she fell asleep most Wednesday nights when we got her home. When she was in junior high, we had the privilege because of her testimony to lead her parents to the Lord, who led their friends to the Lord, who led relatives to the Lord. And so that's how it works, the ripple effect. Thirdly, be intentional to start conversations that lead to spiritual discussions. I encourage you to make plans to think about Saturday, September 16th, to get some fresh insights and make a fresh commitment to share with others about Christ so they can avoid a Christless eternity. And lastly, share your faith story as the opportunity arises. Share your faith story 
as the opportunity arises. Share about your life before Christ, how you came to Christ, and your life after Christ, how he's changed you. And learn to put that in a two or three minute package to share with others. And it's amazing the opportunities you'll have to share the message. Our key thought is this, that every Christ follower has a story of spiritual transformation that needs to be heard by our family and our friends. My prayer is that we develop a burden for the lost, pray for the lost, talk with those who need Jesus, and make this a natural part of our lives, beginning with our prayer time each day. Let's bow for prayer. This morning, as we think about the needs of people around us, the needs of people around the world. I pray in the quietness of this moment that God would just put someone on your heart to make a fresh commitment to share the good news with. There are spouses who need Jesus, and I know they've heard the gospel numerous times. Pray for them. There's neighbors. There's people all around us. And as we go through this week, I encourage you to take these three questions to ponder and consider them in your prayer time and pray that we would have an open door, an open heart, an open mouth. We could come back next week and share how we've had some spiritual conversations this week. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the power of the gospel. We thank you how it transforms lives. Lord, how it prepares us for life here on earth, but secures us for heaven and fills us with joy and purpose. And Lord, may we share these benefits with others of what you've done in our lives as we share the gospel of Christ with them. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you and invite you to stand once again.
Don't forget, in just a few minutes, 1045, we'll meet here with the adults. Kids are downstairs for Sunday school. And we're going to talk about Romans 4 in here, faith versus work. So it'll be a good discussion as we watch J.D. Greer. Uh, turn our attention to the last slide on the screen, if we would, to remind ourselves to connect, to grow, and serve. As we go out today, let's be mindful of the Great Commission as we say this together. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all these that commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, it's been good to gather together in your house where we can gather together in unity with same values, with the same desire to praise and worship and exalt the name that's above every name. We thank you, Lord, today that we could lift up the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to not keep this joy and this love to ourselves, but share it with others as we go out this week and help us to be filled with that joy and that love that you've promised us, no matter our circumstances. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.